All right, good evening. Tonight we are going to be doing our third installment, uh, uh, looking at one of Nitran's major writings, The Senji Show. And um, we are on, let's see, no, that's, hold on one second. We are on slide 13. <coughs> okay. All right, you should see a slide that looks like Buddhism in China during the age of the semblance Dharma. So we have uh, we've we've taken a look at B Buddhism's general spread uh, throughout the the 2,500 year period uh, after the Buddha's death, and then at the end of last week's or uh, uh, two weeks ago, at the end of uh, session two. I was going into a little bit more detailed um, look at uh, Buddhism as it was um, as it entered each of the countries on its uh, progression or its route to Japan. So uh, when when Buddhism finally made it into China uh, over the uh, Tibetan mountain range uh, and also through Afghanistan and through Pakistan. And um, you can just barely see Pakistan off to the side over here, and then Afghanistan would be a little bit uh, up from that. So they're not really on the map, but that was one of the ways that Buddhism entered China. And you can see Tibet here. And uh, so, you know, Buddhism went north, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the more difficult route was over the mountain range uh, through Tibet and into China. Um, so when Buddhism came to China, unlike when it went to, um, you know, Bangladesh, through uh, uh, Burma, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, and the Southeast Asian countries, when it went to the Southeast Asian countries, uh, and Purna, uh, one of the Buddhist major disciples, is credited with the transmission or spread of Buddhism to Southeast Asia. When Buddhism went to Southeast Asia, there was a common uh, liturgical language for, for uh, uh, you could say, it wasn't exclusively liturgical, but it was primarily litur liturgical uh, in nature. In other words, it was used for religious services, religious texts, and uh, religious teachings. And also, I think it was used for some government work as well and for trade purposes. So there was a common common language, I guess you could say, that uh, was uh, evident in all of Southeast Asia. So when it when Buddhism went to Southeast Asia, it's a very narrow corridor which it could pass through. You can see there where my, my uh, cursor is. So it, you know, it, it was, uh, uh, when Buddhism went into Southeast Asia, it was focused. It was um, uh, easy to, uh, to to um, to propagate to a variety of people and the common language it was Pali, hence the when uh, hence the name for the Pali Canon, which um, is the Theravadan uh, teachings, the um, those uh, teachings that are uh, what I say monastic in nature primarily, and this was pre Mahayana. So so Buddhism entered. Uh, Southeast Asia in a unified uh, way with a, uh, a single language. When Buddhism went to China, <clears throat> went north and west to China, or north and east to China, uh, the easiest route for it to have taken was through Pakistan and Afghanistan. And we can actually see evidence of, of the cultural influence of Pakistan and Afghanistan in some of the cases in the Lotus Sutra. Uh, I attended a lecture um, several years ago where um, the teacher from Riso University was saying that there is evidence or there's a reason to suspect that the parable of the burning house was actually composed or influenced strongly uh, by Afghanistan and Pakistan culture. One of the clues to this was the construction or the architecture of the house and in, in primarily in the the gate or the fence that surrounded the house uh, in Indian architecture and, and culture in at this time there were primarily multiple entrances to uh, dwellings 
And, um, and, and since, you know, when the Buddha, when we have the four sightings, he exits through four different gates. The burning house only has one gate, which was characteristic of the architecture of Pakistan, Afghanistan at that particular time. Is this uh, in, in, uh, without controversy or is it absolutely true? Uh, we don't really know, but it is kind of interesting to, to look at the little things in the sutra. And uh, that's, I guess, one of my... Um, my fascinations, and um, you might be able to tell that from some of my writing, that I, I like I like to explore the the little things that we might might miss because a lot of times there is a um, a message there. So Buddhism enters uh, China through Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, through the, across the mountain range in Tibet, and when it does so, there's many different entry points for Buddhist teachings to enter China. And so there's no real unified teaching that arrives in China as a single uh, uh, text or a single teaching. Uh, the sutras arrived in China in a, uh, a variety of order, a variety of sequence, through a variety of different teachers, and even in some cases, a uh, variety of different languages. Primarily, it was transmitted in Sanskrit. And of course, Sanskrit is not a language understood uh, natively by Pakistan, by Afghanistan, or even China. So it had to be translated. <clears throat> and uh, the quality of the translation uh, might vary. The uh, ideological philosophy of the translator would certainly vary. And so the, the sutras uh, had a different look to them when they entered China. It was very confusing. Um, th there was no understanding of the relationship between all the sutras, what order they fell in, what order the Buddha might have taught them in, what order they were supposed to be understood or studied by. And uh, so there, Chi Yi or uh, Tendai, uh, as he's uh, sort of his nickname or his um, uh, Japanese name, Tendai, but Chi Yi is his real name, uh, laid out a way to classify and categorize all of the Buddhist teaching. And in so, in, in so doing, he advocated the supremacy of the Lotus Sutra. Um, you know, my lecture on the Sutra book, uh, in the first part of the book, I talk about the five periods of, um, of Buddhism. And uh, so let's see, I'm looking that up now. Let me tell you what page it's on in case you're interested. You can, all right. Um, I start talking about this on page three, and I talk about the five periods uh, beginning page four. Um, and what, what, what Chihi did was he grouped the sutras according to five periods, with the fifth period being the, uh, the, the Lotus Sutra period. So in the fifth period, uh, the, it said, I say here, I. Uh, the Chi concluded the Lotus Sutra represented the final truth of the Buddha. And in several places in the Lotus Sutra, we have the Buddha actually uh, himself saying that. Um, so the, the, the Lotus Sutra, while not physically the last sutra taught, because the, um, oh, um, all of a sudden I'm uh, drawing a blank. The, uh, the, the last sutra taught by the Buddha was the... Um, no, sorry about this. Kind of tired here. Um, why am I not remembering this? You can, oh, the Nirvana Sutra. You can see my uh, imperfect, uh, imperfect human nature here to forget things. So the Nirvana Sutra was actually the last sutra uh, taught by the Buddha. However, the Nirvana Sutra... Uh, the Lotus Sutra. Uh, everything prior to the Lotus Sutra in an indirect sort of way points to the Lotus Sutra. Definitely the Sutra of Immeasurable Meanings, um, the Sutra right, uh, taught right before the Lotus Sutra, definitely points to the Lotus Sutra. The Lotus Sutra itself points to itself, and uh, even the sutras that follow it um, point to the Lotus Sutra. So everything, if we, if we step back and look at all the teachings, everything points to the Lotus Sutra. And this is something that, that Chihi 
managed to sort out uh, with the hodgepodge nature in which Buddhism uh, entered China. So, in fact, while I'm while I'm here talking about the Sutra of Immeasurable Meanings, I'd like to just say that um, you know when we when we enter the Lotus Sutra, the Buddha is sitting in meditation, and there's this huge assembly, and and without without being aware of the Sutra of Innumerable Meanings taught uh, just uh, prior to the Lotus Sutra, we wouldn't really understand how these people got there, why they were there, what the Buddha was doing, why he was doing it. But in the, you know, the, the Lotus Sutra is actually a continuation of the Sutra of, in, uh, of Innumerable Meanings. And the Sutra of Innumerable Meanings uh, concludes with the Buddha uh, there's a huge congregation there. The Buddha gets finished teaching this very short sutra, and then he goes into his samadhi, his meditation. So Buddhism enters China, um, and uh, the Hoso school, as it appeared in China, adopted the idea that teachings should be uh, presented using only the guideline of the capacity of the people, ignoring the concept of time and country. <clears throat> and what I've been pointing out uh, various times during this, uh, the, the first two parts of this lecture is that Nietzsche is, uh, in a, is, is uh, making a doctrinal case for ignoring uh, uh, everything but the time as a qualification for teaching the Buddhist sutras, the Lotus Sutra. But the Hoso school uh, it, that spread in China <clears throat> adopted the idea that teaching should be presented only with the guideline of the capacity of the people, uh, ignoring the concept of time and country. So people of the three vehicles should be taught the single vehicle, and others uh, for whom it is too complex should be taught something else, or uh, even some of those of the three vehicles should be taught uh, th that uh, something else. So the Hoso school believed that capacity of the people should be the determining factor of what teaching should be taught and that uh, the correct teaching to be taught might vary according to a particular person that, uh, that is being taught. Okay, I'm changing the slide now. Um, do you see a slide titled Buddhism in Japan during the age of semblance dharma? Yes. Great. All right. Good. This is working. So initially, Buddhism came uh, uh, to Japan through Korea. I had mentioned this last time. So it crossed this narrow strait here and entered into China. I mean, entered in Japan. And Prince Shotoku designated the Lotus Sutra, the Vimalakirti Sutra, and the uh, Srimata Sutra to be the foundational or fundamental dharmas for practitioners of the country of Japan. Uh, just a little background here. I'm not uh, familiar with the Srimala Sutra, but the Vimalakirti Sutra is famous because this is um, this is about a lay practitioner, Vimalakirti, who becomes ill, and the Buddha sends his disciples one by one to uh, go and minister to uh, this uh, very famous and uh, important disciple of the Buddha. And all of his disciples were uh, intimidated and, I guess you could say, bested by the faith and understanding of Vimalakirti. So the Vimalakirti Sutra, uh, of course, is a Mahayana Sutra. And as, uh, as is uh, evident in, in the Mahayana Sutras, the, the lay <laughs> practitioner is elevated and the Vimalakirti Sutra takes it to the highest level of elevating this lay practitioner above even the Buddha's contemporary disciples. So uh, <clears throat> during, that, during this time, Buddhism grew greatly in Japan, and many schools competing for the attention of the emperor and royal approval. So Buddhism is growing like wildfire in Japan, just spreading all over the place. Lots of different varieties, lots of different, uh, again, lots of different sutras being put into a prominent position. Uh, lots of people trying to get favor with the court, uh, trying to get money for temples, uh, trying to get 
recognition for schools and teachings. And eventually, uh, in this crowd of people, in this crowd of schools, Dengyo advocates the supremacy of Tiantai's teachings and the establishment of a Mahayana precept platform. And uh, this is a time of, uh, uh, this is the time, the fourth 500 year period. And this is a time, the practice during this time of period, as I had mentioned in sec, uh, uh, session one, was the construction of temples and um, uh, assembly halls and uh, monasteries and practice centers. And this is definitely what is happening throughout Japan at this time. Um, uh, many of the, uh, there's many temple constructions taking place, especially in the uh, Kyoto area, where, which was the seat of the government uh, prior, uh, uh, for most of, uh, most of Japan's history. And uh, this is not yet quite the uh, fifth 500 year period. So Japanese Buddhism in the latter age of degeneration, during this period, we're going to pr focus primarily on Japan. Uh, the center of, it, of the activities has moved from China uh, now into Japan. At the time of Nichiren, there were, uh, we were 200 years into the latter age, and there were disputes and quarrels uh, within Buddhism. Uh, we see this continuing even into Nichiren's time, that um, that all the schools are competing with each other. All the schools are accusing each other of uh, false teachings or misleading teachings. And uh, when Nichiren arrives on stage, uh, it's almost like all of the attention was focused directly on Nichiren, uh, as if uh, he was a threat to these other schools of Buddhism, and, and he indeed was. Um, he, um, first off, he was uh, uh, adamantly opposed to government influence into religions. Uh, he was opposed to uh, uh, government support. Uh, we could say that maybe this was because government wasn't supporting him, but I do believe that he recognized the uh, potential for corruption uh, he probably saw uh, evidence of the potential of uh, uh, evidence of corruption as uh, uh, the state or government supports or gets involved in a religion. We are certainly experiencing that in our own culture here in the United States at this time. And uh, actually, there's pockets of it uh, throughout the world where uh, religion and government um, have not been uh, kept been kept separate. So uh, Nietzsche says that there should be no doubt about the time being right for the spread of the Lotus Sutra. You know, he looks around him. Um, he uh, sees all the, <clears throat> the misleading doctrines, all the, the conflicting statements by various religions. He sees the corruption of religion and, uh, by government. He uh, sees the, the death of uh, uh, half of the population of Japan in a two-year period of time. Prior to him writing the the Risho and Kokoran, the, his his reason motivation for writing the Risho and Kokoran was not just to establish the the uh, foundation for the supremacy of the Lotus Sutra or for the the single practice of the Lotus Sutra, but also to try to understand why um, why uh, Japan was experiencing uh, so much trouble. Uh, Japan is a prominent, uh, predominantly Buddhist country. Buddhism was highly respected, um, uh, highly recognized throughout uh, the, in, in, you know, the entire population of Japan, and yet people were dying. As I say, in a three-year period, over half the population of Japan died. Uh, earthquakes, famine, disease. Uh, it was just a really, really horrible um, uh, time. Uh, and, and Nietzsche looked at this and said, why? Why is this happening? And so he began a, uh, a, a deep study and search for uh, a way to understand or to make sense of, of why a Buddhist country uh, would not have the protection of the Buddhist deities, the Buddhist gods. And his conclusion was is that uh, Japan, uh, while it was a Buddhist country, had actually abandoned um, the Buddhist teachings. 
and had ignored uh, the Lotus Sutra. And so he uh, stresses the importance of, of uh, practicing the Lotus Sutra as a way to bring back the protection of the Buddhist deities. Uh, quoting um, uh, Nietzsche, when in the fifth 500 year period, no, yeah, I'm sorry. In the fifth 500 year period, when all the teachings of the Buddha are about to disappear, bodhisattva superior practices will be entrusted with the five ideograms of Myoho Renge Kyo as a cure for those slanderers and non believers of Buddhism who suffer. So um, Nietzsche is saying that the time, and uh, the number of times that I've mentioned the time in these three parts uh, uh, it would be a large number to stress the importance of time. Uh, the Buddha in the Lotus Sutra says, who's going to teach this sutra, meaning the Lotus Sutra, who's going to teach it, who's going to spread it in the Saha world in the age after, in this uh, the fifth 500-year period? So the, the qualification that the Buddha sets forth in the Lotus Sutra is not the capacity of the people, not necessarily the country, but the time. When the time comes, who will teach this Buddhism? And uh, Nichiren says that at this time, a bodhisattva superior practices will appear and uh, will propagate or uh, has been entrusted with propagating the five characters of the Myoho Denge Kyo, which is a symbol for the entire Lotus Sutra. So Bodhisattva superior practices um, should be should be somewhere around. We should be able to see him. And um, this all points to Nichiren as who else but Nichiren at this particular time is willing to risk, willing to put forth the effort to propagate the Lotus Sutra. And uh, again, Nichiren is pointing here that it's not the capacity of the people. It's not necessarily the country that's important. What's important is this disqualification or this qualifier of time. All right. Um, so we have the persecution of a practitioner of the Lotus Sutra. Nichiren, as the messenger of the Buddha, is cursed and reviled attacked and exiled, all the while the island of Japan has suffered the predictions in the sutra that would occur during the latter age, except for one. And the one outstanding persecution is that of invasion. And uh, Nietzsche says, if, if, Nietzsche, if Nietzsche is not the true practitioner, then who is? And yet there should be someone, otherwise the Buddha's words are false. So in the Lotus Sutra, we have um, these uh, have predictions of the things that will happen to practitioner of the Lotus Sutra in this latter age uh, degeneration in the Saha world. And it's because of these persecutions and because the difficulty of teaching Buddhism and the the, uh, the difficulty of of convincing people uh, to practice the Lotus Sutra, it's because of this that um, nobody stepped forward. When the Buddha asked who would teach this teaching uh, in uh, the latter age after his death in the Lotus Sutra, uh, the, the Buddha stands before the congregation and said, who will teach the Lotus Sutra in this latter age of degeneration in the Saha world? His contemporary disciples, those people who um, were physically present during the lifetime of the Buddha, they said that they would, but not in the Saha world because it's just going to be too darn hard. There were people from other uh, parts of the universe, other galaxies, uh, other spaces, other times that said, we will, uh, and we'll do it in the, the Saha world. And the, the Buddha said, thank you, but no, thank you. Um, uh, you wouldn't quite fit in. You wouldn't quite understand uh, the uh, the ways of the people of the Saha world. And if you think about, I, I mentioned this frequently, if you think about how we treated E.T., uh, that's a pretty good example of how we treat foreigners, people who are different from us. And so the Buddha recognizes that people from a different galaxy, another part of the universe, another space, another time, would um, would not be able to really relate to the people in this Saha world. 
And this is when the bodhisattvas from underground appear, and uh, then eventually the Buddha transfers the teaching of the Lotus Sutra to bodhisattva superior practices. And uh, Nitran is saying in this uh, this passage here in the in the Senji show that that at this time, and you know, if we think about, if we look back on the history of um, the Lotus Sutra, uh, even to this day, there's no one that has really stood out. Uh, in the way that Nietzsche has, there's no one who's really incurred the the persecution, the tribulations that Nietzsche incurred. So there's there's no one that really we could identify as bodhisattva superior practices other than Nietzsche. So I'm always a little bit um, a little bit mystified or confused when people say, "I want to practice the Lotus Sutra, but I." not going to follow Nietzsche or I don't believe in Nietzsche or, um, uh, you know, I don't like Nietzsche or any number of other things that people will say to, to try to somehow separate Nietzsche from the Lotus Sutra or the Lotus Sutra from Nietzsche. And I'm, I'm always a little bit, to me, that just doesn't make logical sense. How can you say you practice the Lotus Sutra if there's no, uh, uh, superior practice is bodhisattva. Superior practice is bodhisattva must appear, will appear, according to the Lotus Sutra. And if you discount Nietzsche, and if you just toss him out of the picture and say, nope, not going to do it, uh, and still claim that you're a practitioner of the Lotus Sutra, where is your bodhisattva superior practices? So it's sort of an incomplete picture without Nietzsche. Now, that doesn't make Nietzsche a god or a deity or or even a next Buddha, as some denominations wish to uh, teach. It doesn't mean that Nietzsche replaces the Buddha, but Nietzsche is the, the this recipient of this transmission, uh, who's given uh, Bodhisattva superior practices, is given the responsibility of teaching uh, the Lotus Sutra in this particular age. And as a result of that effort, this Bodhisattva superior practice will incur. Uh, various persecutions. And uh, this is an indicator that Nietzsche is saying, okay, uh, you know, he even says this, look around you. Where else in Japan do you find someone who is teaching the Lotus Sutra and experiencing the persecutions outlined in the Lotus Sutra? If he's here, show him to me, uh, you know, uh, bring him forward. But we don't have anybody other than Nietzsche who has incurred these persecutions, who has stood steadfastly uh, to teach the Lotus Sutra. And so almost by default, uh, uh, at least up till now, uh, Nietzsche the guy. Uh, Nietzsche is the, the person who represents uh, Bodhisattva superior practices in this age, the fifth, during the fifth 500-year period after the Buddha's lifetime. So from now until 10,000 years from now, um, you know, it's Nietzsche or else somebody else must appear. And um, as far as the next Buddha goes in chapter one, the Buddha makes that very clear who the next Buddha will be, and that will be Maitreya. And this is recognized throughout all denominations of Buddhism universally that the next Buddha who will appear will be Maitreya, not Nietzsche, not somebody else, but Maitreya. And he will appear for something like three days only. And during this three days, he will be able to transmit his teaching to all of the people of the Saha world. And uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people will attain enlightenment. Or so the general prediction go goes. And then after three, I think it's three days, uh, maybe it's five, but I'm pretty sure it's three days, he will ascend to the uh, Tutsi heaven. And uh, that'll be the end of Buddha's, um, there's no, money, no more predictions after that. Uh, who knows what will happen? I doubt that I will be alive still, but, um, you know, uh, stranger things have happened, I suppose. So if Nietzsche is not the true practitioner, then who is? And yet there should be someone. Otherwise, the words of the Buddha would be false. All right. So the Lotus Sutra during the ages of the true Dharma and the semblance Dharma. <coughs> Pardon me. 
So Nietzsche points out that, so, uh, you know, pr previously we've looked at Buddhism in general uh, as it's spread throughout the, um, the regions of uh, India, Southeast Asia, China, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Now we're going to look at the Lotus Sutra during the ages of the true Dharma and the semblance Dharma. So Nietzsche points out that while people think that the Buddha taught according to the intelligence and faith of the audience, actually it's not so. Otherwise, he should have taught it immediately and even to his relatives. Or why did Bodhisattva never despising preach to slanders of the true Dharma? So uh, countering the argument or refuting the argument that Buddhism should be taught according to the capacity of the people or the faith. Uh, Nietzsche says that if that were so, then the Buddhists should have been able to teach the Lotus Sutra right away um, based on the capacity of his disciples, that he would not have needed to wait so long. Or even he may have taught it to his relatives who certainly had firm faith. And why did Bodhisattva never despise, preach to slanderers of the true Dharma? So Bodhisattva never despised, <coughs> uh, <clears throat> practiced the bowing, uh, the revering, the respecting and honoring of all people because they were Buddhas for this activity, which was the appropriate Lotus Sutra practice of his time. For this activity, he was uh, reviled. He was beaten with sticks. Uh, people threw stuff at him. They tried to hit him, so on and so forth. Um, should probably back up here. Uh, so the Lotus Sutra is a manifold Lotus Sutra. In other words, there are many different versions of it, uh, many different ways of practicing, uh, different sizes. So our Lotus Sutra is 28 chapters. The Lotus Sutra practiced by Bodhisattva Never Despise was, I think, 26 characters long. There's uh, mention of 80,000 volume Lotus Sutras uh, in different uh, parts of the universe, in different space, in different time. So the Lotus Sutra, as a defining uh, fundamental truth, if, if, you, if we will, if we think, if we uh, you know, move away from the thought of the physical manifestation of the Lotus Sutra, such as our 28-volume Lotus Sutra, and we look at the fundamental truth that's revealed and taught in the Lotus Sutra, then the Lotus Sutra can look differently and still be the same. So it can have different dressing, different clothing, different textures, all this stuff, but it's still the fundamental uh, truth of the Lotus Sutra. And this is what Bodhisattva never despised, was practicing when he bowed to people and revered them and honored them. And Nietzsche is saying, if we only looked at the capacity of the people, or if we were concerned about people disrespecting or um, slandering the Lotus Sutra, then Bodhisattva never despised would have never uh, taught the Lotus Sutra in his lifetime by bowing, honoring, revering, and respecting all the people. But yet what Bodhisattva Never Despised did was instead of stop, instead of not teaching, he just steps back. He moves further away so it's more difficult for people to hit him. And he continues teaching or practicing the Lotus Sutra. And in this way, he was enabled to enable, he was able to enable countless thousands of people to attain enlightenment and his own lifetime was extended. So while no one directly taught the Lotus Sutra prior to um, uh, uh, the appearance of Nietzsche, there are many references to it as uh, and its superiority once Mahayana Buddhism began to spread. So once Mahayana Buddhism um, uh, broke away or the Mahayana schools broke away from the Theravadan schools and began to assert their own uh, practices, their own teaching, um, we do see the uh, appearance of the Lotus Sutra. Tiantai, Miaolo, Dengyo all referenced it, but realized that the time was not quite right for its spread because it was not yet the latter age of degeneration or Mahpo, as stated in the Lotus Sutra. So, <clears throat> pardon me, Tiantai or Chihi, Miaolo, and Dengyo 
all spoke about the Lotus Sutra, all referenced the Lotus Sutra, all revered the Lotus Sutra, but it wasn't quite right. The timing wasn't quite right to emphasize the superiority and supremacy and singularity of a practice devoted to the Lotus Sutra. So people knew it was there. Uh, they were aware of it. They recognized its importance, but they also understood that it wasn't quite right the time for uh, its uh, emergence as the superior single practice, uh, universal practice for all people. Tiantai or Chi in the age of the semblance Dharma. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, he he uh, referred to the Lotus Sutra as a relationship between the Lotus Sutra and all those sutras to that being of oceans and rivers. So all rivers flow to the ocean. All the Buddha's teachings lead to the Lotus Sutra. It's not the other way around. Um, we don't find evidence of the oceans um, flowing into rivers. And uh, conversely, our, uh, also, we do not find evidence of the Lotus Sutra pointing to other sutras. The Lotus Sutra is not, um, is not something, uh, there are some people who say that the Lotus Sutra replaces all the other Buddhist, all the other teachings of the Buddha, or that somehow or another we can ignore teachings of the Buddha and just focus on the Lotus Sutra. And I'd like to say that this would be a false conclusion. For one thing, uh, within the Lotus Sutra, we have reference to the Four Great Vows. So how could you believe or practice the Lotus Sutra without also believing and understanding and knowing about the Four Great Vows? I mean, the, uh, the, the I'm sorry, the, um, my mind sometimes wanders uh, uh, w without these, these um, Four Noble Truths. Uh, it, it's not possible to read or to study or to believe in the Lotus Sutra without recognizing the Four Noble Truths. It's also not possible to read or revere the Lotus Sutra without recognizing and upholding the Eightfold Path or knowing about it. It's not possible to read the Lotus Sutra, to revere it, to honor it, to cherish it, without also understanding the 12 link chain of causation and dependent origination. These are all fundamental teachings of the Buddha that appear over and over throughout all of his teachings, and they also appear in the Lotus Sutra. So the Lotus Sutra in no way refutes or replaces any of the Buddha's previous teachings, of fundamental teachings, such as the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the 12 link chain of causation. They are all in the Lotus Sutra. And so all of these uh, previous teachings are included in the Lotus Sutra and point to the Lotus Sutra. The Buddha's entire lifetime of teaching and preaching was directed toward this event of the teaching of the Lotus Sutra. Then we have Dengyo in the age of the semblance Dharma. So Nichiren states that generally, Tendai and Dengyo were the only practitioners of the Lotus Sutra in the 1800 years after the Buddha's uh, death. And it should be noted that um, I had mentioned in a, uh, one of the previous parts that that Chihi or Tendai, um, he, um, he, he, his teaching was very uh, theoretical, uh, very deep. Uh, very difficult to understand, and which was appropriate uh, during the time in which he taught. And almost immediately after um, uh, Tiantai's death, uh, very few people continued to practice uh, Tiantai's uh, Buddhism in China. Uh, it virtually died out. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it was too theoretical. It was too complex doesn't mean it wasn't true. It just means that in this time, the capacity of the people was not yet appropriate for understanding this, uh, his, his great teachings. So, um, so while these people 
Tiantai or Qi and Dengyo and Miao Lo, while they knew about Buddhism, while they, I mean, knew, knew about the Lotus Sutra, while they themselves revered and honored the Lotus Sutra, um, the, beyond their, their personal beliefs and personal practice, they did not do much to promote um, the superiority, the single practice of the Lotus Sutra. It just wasn't yet time, the time wasn't right. All right. Well, now we have uh, the refutation of the Pure Land School of Buddhism. Honin advocated the single practice of the Nembutsu, Namu Amida Butsu, saying that during the age of the latter age, or during the time of the latter age, it would be impossible to attain enlightenment through any other practice. So this is what Honin says. He also declared that it was too difficult to practice the Lotus Sutra. Yet within the Lotus Sutra, um, it clearly counters this argument and also acknowledges the difficulty of practicing the Lotus Sutra during this age. So it should come as no surprise that it would be hard. So Honin's argument against the Lotus Sutra was too darn hard, um, that uh, the way for people to attain enlightenment is the the revering, the uh, the uh, the reciting of Amida Butsu's name, and revering Amida Butsu, and then once uh, that practitioner died, they would be immediately reborn in the Western Paradise, <coughs> and from that point would um, carry out Bodhisattva practices and eventually attain enlightenment or Buddhahood. Uh, first off. The Amida Buddha is a, um, a, a uh, one of the emanations of Shakyamuni Buddha. So he's uh, Amida Buddha is, uh, in a way, we could say fictitious. He's uh, he just represents one aspect of the Buddha, or she. Um, it represents one aspect of the Buddha, not all aspects of the Buddha, um, and, and so and there's. No, um, there's no reference to the Pure Land in the Lotus Sutra. So, of all the Buddha's supreme teach, of all the Buddha's teachings, which the Buddha uh, clearly states that the Lotus Sutra is the ultimate teaching of his, this Western Pure Land is not referenced. The practice of Nembutsu is not referenced, and Honen uh, uh, ar argues that the Lotus Sutra is too difficult for people, and hence we should just practice the Nembutsu. That to understand, to practice the Lotus Sutra would be too hard. And Nichiren say, well, yeah, the, it says so in the Lotus Sutra. So the, the, the fact that it's difficult to practice is not a indication or not a, quali a determining qualification of whether or not the Lotus Sutra is the appropriate teaching. The Lotus Sutra says it's going to be hard. Um, and the Lotus Sutra says that there will be people who are eminently qualified to teach the Lotus Sutra in this latter age of degeneration. And they are none other than the Bodhisattvas who appear out of the ground. So Nietzsche is saying to say that the Lotus Sutra will be hard is, um, is really kind of uh, an understatement that uh, even the Lotus Sutra admits that it will be difficult. So Pure Land Buddhism believes that, as I said, after, after death, there will be a rebirth in the Western paradise of Amida Buddha. And after being reborn in Amida's realm, then one can begin practicing to become enlightened. All right. Let's see. <clears throat> All right. Um, we are almost at our one hour. There's about 10 or so minutes left. And what I'd like to do is wrap up the um, the presentation for today and leave it right here at uh, Pure Land School, and then open it up for questions and answers for whoever's here. Let me go back to my slides. Okay, so all right, and who do we have present? All right, still uh, Brandon uh, is here. All right, Brandon, if you will unmute yourself. <coughs> and if you will unmute yourself, and we'll go ahead and, and do some question and answers here. Um, uh, any questions, comments, um, anything? 
any uh, points that you would like clarified. All right, uh, Reverend Jones. Well, actually, right now I am still in the process of viewing the uh, Sinji show. So at this time, I don't really have any other questions. Okay. Uh, anything about what I covered tonight? That um, um, it, uh, probably everything is uh, uh, sort of just floating out there and doesn't appear really connected to anything else. <laughs> but in, 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 even in that state, is there something that you'd just like to talk about or some uh, observation or a thought or feeling, even if it's, you know, unrelatable to anything else? Well, I just wanted to say thank you um, for your, your time and your just your immense amount of knowledge uh, and, and and the willingness to share that with me. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, it's it's my my pleasure. I I. Uh, I get excited about doing this, maybe a little bit too much so, but, um, uh, you know, I, I like to be able to share all this information. I also give, try to fill it in with a lot of, a lot of stuff. If, you know, if I were just sticking to the slides and uh, the, the prepared text that I originally typed for the slides, we would have been done by now. We could have gone much faster. But I feel that it's important for me to, to try and paint a as clear a picture of all the stuff that's going on and uh, all the little nuances um, uh, because as people people in this current age who might read the Lotus or read Nietzsche's writings if they're not aware of some of the historical and cultural information background if information if you will if they're not aware of that then it's difficult to understand perhaps even the words that Nietzsche used or why he was saying a particular thing. And also I think that, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> pardon me, this is not necessarily universally so, but many people have said that they find Nietzsche's writings a little confusing. Uh, Nietzsche is <clears throat> very detailed in his uh, logical approach. And uh, for some, <clears throat> for some people that's, pardon me, confusing and <clears throat> difficult to follow. And I like to kind of, because of my nature, I'm a more, uh, I'm less linear and more circular in my approach to teaching and studying. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> pardon me. <clears throat> Let me get a sip of water here. <clears throat> and so I kind yes, of just uh, go all around. Right, right. And actually, I just wanted to say that, you know, coming from uh, SGI for so many years, mm -hmm. I am in a position where I'm really having to kind of like relearn Buddhism. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's, it, it is difficult because... Uh, I've, I've just been programmed in such a way that what you're sharing with me is one reason why I decided to leave SGI and look at me for the two. I just feel that a lot of what you're sharing with me is information that SGI never even taught. Yeah, there's um, certainly some truth to that. And, uh, um, you know, over the years, um, uh, over the years, their, their approach to teaching uh, Nietzsche and Buddhism has, um, I would, you know, my, my personal opinion is that it has veered away from um, what Nietzsche had in mind. Uh, of course, they have their, their uh, reasons why they do what they do, and you know everybody has a reason for what, why they do what they do. And 
when was the last time you walked into a church and the minister stood before you and said, you know, we're just the third or fourth best religion. Um, you know, so everybody has a has a, a reason or a proof for what, what why they do what they do. Uh, I like to kind of point out some of the um, some ways to to re-examine some of the reasons that are given by other denominations uh, for their practice, and just point out uh, the or give the person listening the opportunity to reflect upon what is actually being said in the Lotus Sutra and what is being espoused by any particular denomination. Uh, how can we say that we are a Lotus Sutra school, regardless of which denomination we're talking about? How can how can we say we're a Lotus Sutra school and then, one, abandon Nietzsche's um, uh, teachings, two, replace Nietzsche, uh, replace the Buddha with Nietzsche, uh, three, say that somehow or another the Lotus Sutra replaces uh, other Buddhist teachings, and so on and so forth. It's really not, there's, there's really no no logical way that you can get from the Lotus Sutra to any of those other positions. And, uh, and you know, I just point this out so that everybody can make an informed decision. Now, I'm not saying that there's no benefit with practicing with any particular denomination, whether it's Risho Kosei Kai, uh, SGI, Nichiren Shoshu, um, um, and uh, Kempon Hoke Kai, uh, any of the uh, variety of other Nichiren denominations. I myself believe that there's benefit in chanting the Odai Moku, regardless of which denomination or which flavor you practice. Now, not all people uh, are as open or as generous as that. A lot of people would like to say that, no, you can't possibly attain enlightenment. And my own my own view on this uh, personally, and we're, you know, and this may or may not be against some people's understanding of doctrine, but um, there's value in in, uh, in in revering the Lotus Sutra, and there will be there will be, will bound to be various interpretations and various understandings, even among uh, Nichiren and Shu priests. Uh, different people uh, are motivated, are moved by uh, different parts of the Lotus Sutra. Different people have different ways of practicing. Different people even have different ways of teaching the Lotus Sutra. I certainly have a unique and different way of teaching the Lotus Sutra that um, people may or may not agree with. And that's perfectly okay. It's a big universe. There's lots of space for all of us. And uh, I think we do more harm when we become exclusive and uh, condemning people of other, um, even other religions. Um, there has been some psychological studies, some uh, looking, at some studies done uh, looking at at, um, at the brain, at uh, our uh, capacity to think and reason. And uh, there's an interesting book that was written that says that there's a uniqueness among humans, and that is that no matter what happens to us, no matter what happens to any one of us, each of us is very skillful at constructing a narrative that proves or validates our belief. So anybody, it, I mean, you know, we, we, that's part of being a human is that we are able to make sense out of the stuff that happens to us. And religion is one of those ways that we do that. And so even, uh, you know, I work in a hospital. I frequently am called upon to do Christian prayers. I frequently listen to and um, experience people claiming um, religious miracle or a religious message, a spiritual message from you know, their supreme being from their deity. And you know what? I believe them. And I think it's true. And I also think that what I say and what I believe is true also. I can prove my point to other people from my perspective only. They can prove their point to other people and to me from their perspective only. 
And that's part of the challenge to us as human beings is entering into the perspective of the other person for even just a moment so that we can appreciate and understand their truth. Now, I do believe that the Lotus Sutra and Buddhism in, Buddhism in general and the Lotus Sutra in particular represents a, a way to approach life that um, is more empowering, less diminishing than other practices that rely on beings or deities outside of oneself. But that's not to say that those practitioners of those religions cannot um, become enlightened or cannot become happy. I think what the Lotus Sutra offers us and what Nichiren Buddhism teaches us is that the Odaimoku, the Namu Myoho Rengekyo, is a universal way in which every body can attain enlightenment. Now, that's not to say that, there, that it's not possible for people to attain enlightenment by other means. But it is to say that those other means may not be universally accessible or universally understood or universally practiced by people throughout time and space. Something that the Lo Sutra, the chanting of Odaimoku, uh, brings to us uh, across all cultures, across all languages, and even entering into various beliefs. Um, I know uh, Christians who chant, who have chanted the Odaimoku with me. And um, that's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing when people of other faiths, um, Jews even, who have chanted the Odaimoku, have chanted along with me and, um, and entered into my path. Uh, there's a great potential for us to deepen our faith in the Lotus Sutra by, by understanding other people's faith as well. Uh, we look at Christians in particular, you know, I'm not picking on Christians here, but we look at Christians and, and the way that uh, many of them, in a wholesome way, in a healthy way, the way that they have faith, strong faith, uh, the way that they make sense of their world from their religious perspective. It's incredible. In a way, we don't find such passion amongst Buddhists. And, and why not? Why don't we have that kind of passion? Nichiren certainly had that kind of passion. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. You know, uh, why, you know, we look at Christians who, you know, spend lots of money, time, and life um, establishing missions, going to foreign countries, building schools and nurseries and hospitals. They're acting out their faith, and yet... Where do we see this in Buddhism today? It used to be in Buddhism, uh, in China, even in uh, India, but it's not here. We, you know, we don't see examples of Buddhists really going out and being missionaries. And yet the Buddha calls on us to do that. So I think that there are truths all over the place. We can be myopic in our... Um, uh, recognition of, of other truths, but we miss out on opportunities to learn and to even um, challenge our own beliefs and practices. Right, right. And and actually, you know, being part of SGI for so many years, I really appreciate uh, the fact that I had or was, you know, was able to find it. And uh, you know, introduced to it. It, it, it's really opened up a lot of doors in my life. Yeah. And this actually being one of the doors. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's how I got here, you know, <laughs> through him uh, back in 19, 1969, where it all began. Uh, who would have thought? So where are you physically located? I actually live in Indiana. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Well, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't sure. Um, I thought you said we were in the same time zone in Indiana. Isn't that in central time? No, we are actually Eastern. Okay, all right. Well, then, yeah. yeah, yeah. I need to review my geography then. <laughs> 
All right. Well, uh, uh, so if the, do you have any other comments, questions? They don't have to be questions. They can be just comments. Um, no, I just think that it was a yeah. No, I just think that it was a great uh, study, and I am in a position where hopefully I can, you know, get on more. Yeah. And just you know take it all in. I, I mean, it's a lot of information to take in. <laughs> yeah. But uh, slowly but surely. Well, I am I am not... And, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, oh, oh no, no, no. That, that's fine. Well, I was just going to say... I yeah. really appreciate all of this, the slides. I think that the slides along with you, your... Uh, uh, being able to explain everything as you go is really helping me. Well, good. Feel free to let me know if something doesn't help. Um, I, I, okay. I really um, I hope that people will feel empowered to, um, to point out things that are not working for them because just because I do it doesn't make it right. And um, I, I, I'm not in a hurry to go through these slides. There's one whole session that we will be talking about um, just propagation and what is appropriate. And uh, that's, in fact, uh, it's one of the, the things that uh, over time, my, my understanding of propagation has evolved. And um, perhaps I can share some of that uh, evolution with, with folks and um, maybe open them up to you know, a different or an alternate um, possibility. Um, you know, we all sure. have the possibility of being right in some way. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited about doing that. Actually, I was asked by someone if I was going to cover that, and I said, definitely I am. So uh, stay tuned. And hopefully you'll have a chance to, sometime between now and the next two weeks, you'll have a chance to kind of catch up on the lectures. Um, we're almost done with all of my, well, we probably got another two hours left of slides to cover. Uh, okay. So, yeah, we're probably going to be about five or six uh, parts to this uh, to this lecture series. I've written a lot about the, or, or on the Senji show. Um, for some reason, it has kind of always fascinated me and uh, held my interest. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to we're going to spend some time on it. We're just kind of going to kind of get in here and just uh, relish it instead of rushing sure, through. Sure, sure. Sure, absolutely. Um, now, there is one last thing. Yes. I was wanting to know if you know how to get rid of the feedback in my earphones <laughs> because I hear my voice, and so there's this, like, 10-second delay. <laughs> right. Yeah, I you know, so, I don't have a solution for that. Um I, I'm not sure. I mean, some of some of the folks listen using headphones. Some of the folks listen without headphones. Uh, you know, even myself, like tonight, I've not gotten any feedback. But uh, at the end part of uh, the lecture two weeks ago, all of a sudden, the feedback started on my end. And yes, I understand how annoying it is, and nobody else hears it. And there you are, kind of uh, waiting for yourself to catch up with yourself. And uh, people are. Probably thinking, scratching their head, what is wrong with this person? But I, I understand. I don't know what to suggest to you, except perhaps maybe even disconnecting the headphones and just listening to the speaker out loud. Um, I, I don't have a, I don't have a solution for it. Um, okay, my, my, well, I'll just try that then next time. I'll yeah, just or, unplug and see if that helps. Yeah, or else, uh, while you're speaking, turn your volume down so that you can barely even hear it over your headphones or through your speaker. And that way it'll make it a little bit easier for you to stay focused on what you're actually saying, as opposed to waiting for yourself to catch up with yourself. That might be something you could try as well. It's annoying. I don't have an answer for it. Um, this is, uh, uh, this technology, GoToMeeting is, is all right. It's, um, it's probably the best uh, option that's available within the price range that we can afford. 
it's not perfect. There are a lot of things that I'm not happy with, um, but I do like the fact that we can we can uh, stream, we can have a conversation real time. Uh, it is a, a low, uh, it has a low footprint on your computer's operating system. Uh, Skype, uh, you know, which now you can do some uh, interactive uh, chatting on Skype, but it is a, um, a high drain on. Uh, Computing, computing capacity along with bandwidth on the stream, uh, you know, for your download and upload. But the go-to meeting, uh, right. <clears throat> even on the oldest machines and the slowest machines, uh, I think that go-to meeting still provides a better experience. And even at low um, uh, internet speeds, I mean, most everybody has DSL or cable, but there are some, there's, well, I, there's a member in Virginia who still uses, uh, well, it's not quite dial-up, but it's a little bit higher than, just a smidge higher than dial-up. Uh, so, you know, her, her upload-download speed is very slow, and yet the uh, go-to meeting is, is not in, um, uh, impossible. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, we'll wrap up the study for tonight and Let's see, where's my cursor? There it is. We'll wrap up the study for tonight. I'm going to uh, mute you now, and uh, we'll chant Odaimoku three times together, and and uh, we'll we'll uh, conclude things. So, thank you very much for joining tonight, and for the folks who may be listening to this recording on YouTube at some point in the future. Thank you very much for viewing it, and uh, we will go ahead and close uh, with chanting the Odaimoku. Thank you very much. Hi, Namu Myo Den Gekyo Namu Myo Den Gekyo Namu Myo Den Gekyo All right, so thank, thank you very much, Brandon. And uh, you and I will be uh, speaking by Skype or phone uh, on Wednesday. I'm looking forward to that. Okay. Yes, that is correct. Thank you very much, Reverend Jones. Great. All right. Well, you have a good evening, and uh, we'll see you uh, next time. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good night.